This partial podcast is dedicated for the complete refor shalema, the complete and total and swift recovery of Amy Batavora. May she live a long, happy, healthy, and fruitful life until 120 years. I am super excited to be back for the Parsha podcast. This is Parsha's Teruma. I have three interesting ideas I want to share with the Parsha podcast audience. And I want to end off the podcast with a question that I had on the Parsha, something to ponder. If you have an answer, you can always email me, RabbiWalby at gmail.com. If you don't have an answer, you have questions, you have comments, you have feedback of any kind, I am eager to get your email. So, of course, our Parsha talks about the tabernacle, the Mishkan, and it begins with delineating the materials needed to assemble the various vessels and the structure of the Mishkan. Now, the first idea I want to share on this Parsha is this observation that the name of this effort of gathering the materials is Terum, that's, of course, the name of the Parsha. And this term, terum, is actually used elsewhere in Jewish life. If you have a field in the land of Israel, and your field produces a yield for a given year, so you have to give tithings on what you produce. The first tithing that you have to give for some of the produce, it's a discussion which produce is included, but the first tithing, let's say you have wheat, you produce a yield, the first tithing has to go to the Kohen, and that is called the Truma, and that is one-fiftieth or two percent of that year's yield. Now, isn't it interesting, isn't it noteworthy that the word that our parsha uses to describe the fundraising effort for the Mishra for the tabernacle is the same word that is used elsewhere in Jewish literature for the Kohanic tithe, the 2%, the 150th of the field and of the produce that is given to the Kohen. Now, the Talmud already acknowledges this overlap. The Talmud of the Book of Sanhedrin, page 39a, has a very interesting discussion between a heretic and one of the great rabbis of the Talmud. The heretic tells the rabbi, your God is a priest, is a Kohen. And he quotes the first verses of our Parsha, where God tells Moses, tell the Jewish people, go gather a truma for me. Well, truma is only given to the Kohen. And if God's asking for a truma, it must be that God is a Kohen. Now, of course, the, the real answer is, is that, well, there's two kinds of truma. There's the truma of our Parsha, fundraising materials for the Mishkan. And there's the truma, which is the tithe, which is not at all being discussed at the beginning of our Parsha. It's the tithe given to the Kohen. And these two words are really not related. But the great rabbi humors him nonetheless and accepts it as a given premise that maybe God is a Kohen. But then asks the heretic, well, when God buries Moses at the end of Deuteronomy, and of course a Kohen, when a Kohen comes in contact with a dead body, the Kohen has to go to the mikvah, has to go to the ritual bath. How does God immerse himself in the mikvah? How does God go through the process of purifying himself after coming to contact with a dead body? After God buries Moses, a Kohen, of course, has to be always ritually pure. Well, a regular Kohen can immerse himself in water. God cannot immerse himself in water. So how does God go to the mikvah after he buries Moses? So the great rabbi responded. Again, he's humoring the heretic and he tells him, well, God immersed himself in fire. And he quotes a verse to substantiate that. So, of course, Rashi already tells us that this whole exchange, like we mentioned, just the rabbi humoring him, he is responding to a preposterous question as if it was credible, even though, of course, it is nonsensical. But regardless, it is noteworthy that the term for fundraising for the materials for the Mishkan, for the tabernacle, is the exact same word that's used for the priestly tithe. And maybe there is something there. Maybe there is some sort of connection between these two ideas that could shed some light on the tabernacle, which is going to be the main subject matter, of course, of our Parsha, the Parsha that follows, essentially, on the rest of the book of Exodus. So the Baal Turim, one of the commentators on the Torah, he points out that the Turuma, the tithing to the Kohen, is one-fiftieth of the bounty. You have a hundred bushels, you give two of them to the Kohen. And he points out that on Temple Mount, 
And of course, the Mishnah, on the tabernacle, is this portable, movable temple, if you will. And then it gets established on Temple Mount. But if you take the Temple Mount, the size of Temple Mount, and you figure out what percentage of that is the temple, the, the footprint of the temple, what percentage does it take up? It turns out that the temple took up 150th of Temple Mount, which is the same ratio of the Teruma of the Kohanic tithe. But what exactly the connection is between the Truma, which is the Kohanic tithe, which is the 150th of the produce that you give to the Kohen, and this Truma, this fundraising effort, the first thing we find out about the Mishkan, it's not immediately clear. I want to maybe make a suggestion. We know that the number 50 is a very important number in Jewish philosophy. And the way it works out is that we have the concept called the number 7. And the number 7 appears, of course, in many places in, in the Torah and the mitzvos. So you have, for example, the seven days of the week. And that is this repeating unit that is one of the rules of our world that every week is seven days. And then you have the number 8, which is 7 plus 1. And that is supernatural. So seven is natural. It's the nature, it's the physics, it's the rigidity of the rules of this world. And then eight is supernatural. And that's why, of course, when we do the bris mila, we do the circumcision, it's on the eighth day to symbolize the supernatural relationship that we have with God. And then if you have seven times seven, well, that too is natural. Seven is natural. And seven times seven is also natural. And that plus one is supernatural. So we have 49, and then we have the 50th. We have the 49, which is 7 times 7, that's natural. And then the 50th is supernatural. And that's why we have, of course, the Shemitah cycle, 7 years and 7 times 7 years, and that's 49. And the 50th year, that's the supernatural year, and that's the Yovel. And similarly, we have 7 times 10, and that is 70, and the 70 nations, that's natural. And then you have supernatural, that is the Sanhedrin, comprised of 70 plus 1, supernatural, 71 members of the Sanhedrin. That's an idea that appears in many places in Jewish philosophy. And then we find out, the Talmud tells us, that there are 50 gates of wisdom. 49 of them were given to Moses. But one of them, the 50th gate, Moses was not able to access. And the Ramban in his introduction to the Torah, the Rabban tells us that included in the Torah, included in the corpus that was given to Moses, is everything in those 49 gates of wisdom. But the 50th gate of wisdom, that supernatural gate, well, that refers to God. And that is beyond, so to speak, the scope of Torah. It's the theology. It's beyond the scope of Torah. It's beyond what Moses knew. He only knew 49, and he couldn't access the 50th, there was something that was not included in the giving of the Torah. God gave us the Torah, and that has the rules for all the natural creation, so to speak. But the Creator, that's really the 50th, that's the supernatural, and that is beyond the scope of Torah. What happens after Sinai, after Moses goes up to heaven and gets the Torah? Well, now he's told, okay, now it's time to build a Mishnah. And the obvious question is, wait a minute, if Moshe got the Torah... He got God's wisdom. What is left? What is there that is missing that has to be followed up? The sign experience has to be followed up with this instruction, go build yourself a tabernacle. Maybe there's a very deep insight that's going on over here. The first Midrash on our Parsha tells us that the Torah is the equivalent of God's daughter. At Sinai, there's a marriage, Jewish people and Torah. And that unity is cemented at Sinai. But then God says, I cannot be separated from my daughter. And therefore, make a house, make a room that travels with you, that I, so to speak, can be with you. And that is the idea of the tabernacle. Once we have the Torah, we have God's daughter. Now it's time for us to make a place for God to come visit us, so to speak. He cannot part from his daughter. He cannot part from the Torah. But this is revealing. Again, it's a very deep insight. It's revealing to us that we got the daughter, so to speak, the Torah, but we did not get the father. We did not get God. We got the 49 gates of wisdom, but we did not get the 50th 
creative wisdom. That was lacking. And now we're getting the father as well. Maybe we can speculate that the reason why we have this, this truma, this word, that of course is going to trigger this, these red flags, what does that have to do with the truma? Maybe the secret that's being revealed here is that just as the truma, the tithing, is one fiftieth, so too what's happening here with the Mishkan, with the tabernacle, is we're getting that ever elusive 50th. We're getting, so to speak, the theology that God living amongst us. We're getting what we did not get at Sinai, what was not included in the initial package of giving of the Torah. And this idea got me thinking a little bit on the differences, perhaps, between the temple and the tabernacle. Like we mentioned, the tabernacle has all these vessels and it has the entire structure. And that's, of course, told over in great detail in our parsha and the parshas that follow. But what's interesting is once the Jewish people get to Israel, so the tabernacle is going to be put away and a permanent temple is going to be built by King Solomon. And where does Solomon build his temple? He builds his temple, of course, in the holiest place in the world, on Mount Moriah, called Temple Mount as well. And that's the place where Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice. The sources add Noah offered sacrifices there. Adam offered sacrifices there. Jacob had his dream where he saw that ladder going up to heaven with the angels going up, coming up and down. And he declared that that place is the Shah HaShemayim, that place is the gates of heaven. You have the temple being located in the holiest place in the world. The Talmud adds that the heavenly temple, whatever that means, is directly above the earthly temple. The coordinates of the permanent temple are at a very auspicious place. And then we have our Parsha. And we read about the Mishkan, we read about the tabernacle. And somehow, despite the fact that the tabernacle is going to be mobile, it's going to be disassembled and reassembled in a whole host of places, somehow what's going to have the same holiness as the temple itself. And the question we could ask is, how is it possible that there's holiness in the tabernacle despite the location being always shifting? Every time the Jewish people move, they take the tabernacle and re-erect it someplace else. Its coordinates are off and they're ever-changing. And we know that there's a certain element of the holiness of the temple that is a result of its location. So maybe we can suggest, this is an idea that I want to throw out there. Maybe there is this idea of mobile holiness versus fixed holiness. You know, think about it. We have two mountains, the two most important mountains in, in Jewish history. We have Mount Sinai, where we got the Torah, and we have Mount Moriah, Temple Mount, the place where the temple was actually built. And what's interesting about it is that these mountains, even though they're both very significant to our story, they're very different. Mount Moriah always retained its holiness. The holiness is affixed to the location. Whereas Mount Sinai, it was very holy at the time. In fact, we read the verses God is repeatedly warning the Jewish people, don't come close to the mountain at the time of Sinai, at the giving of the Torah. Don't come close to the mountain. If you come close, you're going to die. You're going to be zapped by the holiness. But what happens after the Sinai experience? The holiness is now been removed, apparently, from Mount Sinai, and you could go on to the mountain, no problem. And it got me thinking about the differences between the Mishkan, the tabernacle, that began at Sinai, but then moved elsewhere. Versus the temple, which is affixed to one location on Temple Mount. We have holiness in both of them, but we have the Sinaitic holiness, which is portable. And it's almost as if you take Jerusalem with you in the Mishkan, whereas the Moriatic holiness that is immovable, you cannot port that over to some other place. And we have these two famous mountains. Each one of them has multiple names. The Midrash actually counts six different names for Mount Sinai. And we know Temple Mount's called Temple Mount, Mount Moriah, Har Yehra Eg. And it's interesting, it's just an interesting thing to ponder that these mountains are both very holy, but very different. You know, 
the sages tell us that all the sustenance in the world flows down from heaven via the temple and temple mount. And then we have the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the Jewish people taking them from place to place, and they too have miraculous sustenance raining down upon them in the form of the manna, but that's not limited to one place. That is wherever they are. The Mishkan, the tabernacle, it's built by Moses, and it was never destroyed. Whereas the temple is built by Solomon, built by Shlomo, and that is subject to destruction, and the temple indeed is destroyed. And then we find out in the sources that there was some difference between Moshe, between Moses who built the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and Solomon who built the temple. Moshe, we're told, he knew the secret of the red heifer. The red heifer is what's used to purify someone after they have come into contact with dead, with the dead body. It's what's used to cleanse death. Moshe is above death. And therefore, the Mishkan that he built is also above destruction. And the Talmud tells us that Solomon, that Shlomo, he craved to know the secret behind the red heifer, but he was not allowed to understand it. And therefore, what he represents is someone that has not conquered death, and therefore the temple that he built was subject to being destroyed. The temple is destroyed, but the tabernacle is indestructible. And this, I think, dovetails with what we were saying earlier. There's something really powerful about the tabernacle. It's that 50th realm. It's that Truma level. It's that angelic level. It's that mosaic, that Moshe level, that it's super holiness, even holiness that exceeded the temple. This is something I wanted to posit to the great Parsha podcast audience, but I want to note that I did see one of the commentators that said the exact opposite, that the temple was indeed more sublime than the tabernacle. Okay, that's just an idea I wanted to throw out there. Now, in our Parsha, we read about three vessels that have crowns. We have the Ark, and that is the crown of Torah, says the Talmud. That's a reference, that's a symbolism for the crown of Torah. We have the table, and that too has a crown around it, and that is a reference to the crown of monarchy. And then we have the altar, and that's a reference to the crown of priesthood. And the Talmud tells us that there are three crowns in the Jewish world. The crown of the table of the monarchy, well, that was taken by David. And therefore, unless you're a descendant of David, you cannot be a king, a monarch in the Jewish people. The altar, the crown of priesthood, well, that was taken by Aaron and his descendants. Me as a non cohen there's nothing I could do to join that fraternity. However, the crown of Torah, as exemplified by the Ark, well, that crown is available for anyone to come. That's where the meritocracy lies. That's the great equalizer. Whoever wants to come and grab the crown of Torah, whoever wants to come and grab the crown of the Ark, is welcome to go do that. Now, as an aside, there's a very nice piece I saw in the Kliyakar, He points out that the sizes, the dimensions of these three vessels are very different. The ark, it's two and a half by one and a half by one and a half amos cubits. All sides are half amos. The shulchan, the table, well, that one has two by one by one and a half. Some of them are round numbers, are full numbers, and some of them are half, are partial numbers. And then you have the priesthood, that's the misbeh, that's the altar. It's one by one by two. All the numbers are round numbers. And he connects that to what each one of these vessels represent. But anyhow, let's talk about the ark for a second. I want to share an idea I heard several years ago regarding the miracles that the Talmud tells us about the ark. The Talmud of the book of Yoma, page 21a, tells us that the ark did not take up any space meaning the ark was put in the Holy of Holies. And in the temple, the Holy of Holies was 20 by 20 amos. But you could count from either side of the ark 10 amos. So the whole enclosure is 20 amos. And you count from one side of the ark to the wall. And from the other side of the ark to the wall, And each one of those would measure 10 amos, 10 cubits, almost as if the ark itself 
did not take up any space. Of course, that is an amazing miracle. And then we have the second miracle that is described in the Talmud in the book of Sota, page 35a, that the ark lifted those that lifted it. Of course, the ark has the staves, the poles on either side, and ostensibly, the people who would carry the ark, they would lift the ark. Says the Talmud, that's not how it actually happened. It was to the contrary. It wasn't that the people who lifted the ark lifted the ark, it was the opposite. It was the ark that lifted those that lifted, ostensibly, or tried to present themselves as if they were lifting the ark. And in fact, it gives us a very great visual of the priests who were carrying the ark after Joshua crossed over the Jordan. They actually floated over the Jordan. They, they were lifted and they crossed over the Jordan in this miraculous fashion. They were flown over by the ark. So isn't it interesting that we have these two very unusual miracles that happen specifically with the ark that represents Torah? So I heard a couple of years ago that this is a description of what it takes to become a Torah scholar. What do you need to do to become a Torah scholar? Of course, you need to study. But studying alone, that's not going to finish the job. The Talmud and other places in Jewish literature make make it clear that what is absolutely paramount, what's absolutely critical if someone wants to become a Torah scholar is that they have to develop a sense of humility. The Talmud tells us you have to be like a field that everyone plows, everyone tramples over you. If you're not someone who has pride, who won't allow someone else to get the edge, you're probably not a great candidate to become a great Torah scholar. If you're like a field, everyone tramples, well, then you're going to go and become a great Torah scholar. Similarly, the Talmud tells us that Torah is comparable to water. Just as water flows to the lowest point, so to Torah flows to the lowest person. The person who is most humble, that's the person that's going to be the greatest receptacle of Torah. Of course, Moshe, he is the greatest exemplar of Torah, And the Torah itself testifies upon Moshe that he was the humblest of all men. Haughtiness and boastfulness, that's going to repel God and God's Torah away from a person. And here we see the Ark is going to embody Torah. And by doing that, it's going to show us what it takes. What it takes is humility. And these miracles are miracles that underscore humility. The ark lifted those that lifted it. What does a haughty person do? When a haughty person sees other people, they always push them down. And here the ark shows us what humility looks like. Humility is all about lifting the people that are around you. When someone's haughty and they dominate the room, wherever they are, it's all about them. They don't leave any place in the room for others. They suck all the air out of the room. And here we have the ark. The ark, if you measure the room in its entirety, it's 20. You put the ark in. How much room is being diminished by the entrance of the ark? None. From one end of the ark to the wall is 10. From the other end of the ark to the other wall is also 10. And that's to demonstrate to us that the true representation of Torah, the greatest embodiment of Torah, the Ark, exemplifies this idea of humility not to dominate the room, to allow others to flourish. If we adopt those characteristics, we're going to prime ourselves to become greater and greater receptacles of Torah. I want to share another unusual and interesting idea that we find in the Midrashic and Tamirach sources, regarding the tachash skins. So like we mentioned, there's 15 different materials needed to build the Mishnah, the tabernacle. And one of them is the tachash hides, the tachash skins. And the Talmud tells us this was a very unusual animal. And the Talmud is not so sure so many details about it. And it says that there was a discussion amongst the sages. Is this a domesticated animal or is it an undomesticated animal? And that question was not resolved. 
Moreover, this Tachash animal had a single horn that came out of its forehead. Moreover, when it availed itself to Moshe, to Moses, it appeared to him because they needed it for the Mishnah, for the tabernacle. But after the tabernacle was built, using the Tachash skin, the Tachash hides, the animal went into hiding, it disappeared, or it became extinct. Now the Midrash adds some more details about this very interesting, very intriguing animal. It tells us that it actually lives in the desert, it has that single horn on its forehead, and on its skin there were six different colors, and they used the skin of this animal to make the various curtains that they would put upon the tabernacle. It's a very unusual description here. This temporary animal is going extinct immediately after it's being used for the tabernacle. It's implied from the Talmud that it wasn't readily available. Rather, it availed itself to Moshe. It has this one horn coming out of its forehead. It sounds like a unicorn. It's got six colors. It's not determined if it's domesticated or an undomesticated animal. It's a really interesting description about this animal. But I saw the Ben Yehoyada says something very interesting. He says, what is the significance of this single horn? You know, many animals that have horns have horns on either side. The right horn and the left horn. And then we have this description about this unusual animal that has only a single horn. So the Ben Yehoyada says that whenever there is a right and a left that always represents, on a Kabbalistic level, it represents kindness and judgment. The right side is kindness, the left side is judgment. And therefore, if we had something with a right and a left, it would refer to settlement and to destruction. We'd have the good and we'd have the bad. But the Mishkan, the tabernacle, it was the only edifice of God that was never destroyed. Of course, the first temple was destroyed. The second temple was destroyed. But the Mishnah, the tabernacle, it was built by Moshe. And then when they built the permanent temple, they just archived. They put away the Mishnah, but it was never destroyed. And he explains, like we mentioned earlier, this was made by Moshe. And therefore, whatever Moshe made, it had permanence. It had continuity. And therefore, there was no right and left. There wasn't these opposite extremes. Rather, there was a certain unity which is what he describes as pleasant, sweet mercy that hints at its continuity. And I think this does lend some credence to our earlier postulation that the Mishkan was indeed holier than the temple. I want to conclude with a question that, again, you could send your answers to RebelWorldRegima.com, and that's going to revolve around the menorah. So the menorah is this candelabra. We know what a menorah looks like. And Rashi tells us that Moshe did not understand what the menorah looked like until he was shown it. So Rashi in verse 40 of chapter 25 tells us that Moshe couldn't visualize the menorah until he was shown it with a menorah of fire. And even today we could say Jews are not known for their visual spatial intellect. And this kind of makes sense. You know, there's a description here of menorah. You can understand that Moshe needed to see an image of menorah before he could make it. That's what Rashi says in verse 40. The problem is, in verse 31, Rashi gives us a whole different description as to how the menorah was made. Again, Rashi says that Moshe had a hard time to understand the menorah. And God said, okay, don't deal with it. Just take all the gold and throw it into the fire, and it will be made by itself. And indeed, Moshe took the gold, threw it all into the fire, and what emerged was the menorah. So the first question we have to ask is, you know, we have apparently a contradiction here between the two interpretations of Rashi. According to one, Moshe made it himself after he was shown the image of the menorah made out of fire. Well, then he made it. He knew what to make. And then we find this alternative explanation in Rashi that he didn't make it even after he saw it. He just threw all the gold into the fire and and what emerged was the menorah. 
So that's the first question. How do we reconcile this contradiction or apparent contradiction in Rashi? But isn't this interesting? We have this very, very bizarre way of mating of a menorah. Moshe doesn't understand how to do it. So he just gives up apparently. And he just chucks the whole thing into the fire. All the gold goes into the fire. And whatever comes out, let that emerge. And what comes out? The menorah. But the question I want to pose, if we fast forward several chapters, chapter 32 of Exodus, that's the nadir of the whole book when the Jewish people decide to make the golden calf. And that, of course, is apparently idolatry, and that's going to lead to a lot of terrible consequences. How did they make the golden calf? So Rashi tells us, chapter 32, verse 4, that they did the same method. They took the gold, they assembled the gold, they threw it into the fire, and what emerged was a golden calf. So the question that I want to pose is, what is the connection, or is there a connection, between these two processes, between the process of taking gold and throwing it into the fire and what emerges is a golden calf? And that's what the Jewish people did when Moshe was still in heaven getting the Torah. And then you have Moshe later on, even though, of course, the chronology is altered, but Moshe later on, he's told to make a menorah, and he throws the gold into the fire, and then the menorah emerges. How is it possible that the identical process is going to yield such opposite results? This throwing the gold into the fire in one instance is going to bring about the golden calf, and in a second instance is going to bring about the menorah, which is going to be deployed in the Mishkan. It's an idea to think about. And if you have any suggestions, please email me, rabbiwalbi.com. I look forward to hearing any suggestions and any questions or comments of any kind. And again, thank you all for listening. I apologize that I missed out last week, but hopefully we'll be back on track with the Parsha podcast going forward. Until next week, Shabbat Shalom from Torch in Houston, Texas.